We always like to start off our coffee chats with a nice big hello. If you are comfortable, uh, we'd love to invite you to turn on your camera just for a moment and feel free to unmute yourselves. And we like to just do a big, you know, wave your hands so we can see each other, a big smile and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Hi. Hello. It's nice to see some uh, returning faces. We always feel like we're uh, getting to see uh, new friends here, uh, returning friends. And so let me share my screen again. And start the... Okay. So some of you heard all these instructions when we were um, doing our kind of soft start, our unofficial welcome, but I'm gonna run through these really quickly just to make sure everybody is on the, the right language channel. Uh, we do have simultaneous trans, uh, interpretation provided today by Stella Lauerman. So we wanna make sure that people are on the right language channel. If you want to listen in, in Spanish, um, then we're going to encourage you to click on that globe icon and then select Spanish as your language and make sure that you check mute original audio so you don't hear the English and Spanish at the same volume. If you're listening in English, you also need to, to click that globe icon and then select English. And then so that we have a way of, of just knowing what language everybody is participating in, we're gonna ask you to rename yourselves in the participant list. So click on the participant icon um, in your meeting taskbar. It's, it's that picture that looks like a couple of heads of people. So open that list. It should open up something that looks like um, this list that you see over on the right-hand side here. And when you hover your mouse over your name, you should see a blue more button appear. And when you click on that, see the option to rename. Before they I'd like you. to ask you to um, type an E. 30 minus what? If you're on the English channel. Oh, it's okay. Oh, or an okay. S if you're listening in Spanish. Or B if you're bilingual and you might actually be switching back and forth. So that just helps yeah, us get a sense of who's participating and what language you're participating in. Okay, so th that's it for our little kind of overview of the logistics. Again, we are recording this session. And uh, we're very pleased to have everybody here. To, uh, we're excited to hear about everything that um, various partners have been doing in our county around the area of housing and COVID. This is um, what we're considering part one of this topic. We do have a, a future topic where we'll um, explore a little bit more with a different set of presenters and. So today we're starting off hearing about uh, efforts that have, that have been undertaken to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness Dylan. during this time of COVID. Yeah, Dylan, so I we're don't joined see by here. Um, our guest, Leslie Goodson, who's the COVID shelter and care branch lead at the Human no Department for the county. And also joined by Joey Cartagini, from, who's a health services manager for Homeless Persons Health Project, which is part of the health services agency and Tom Stagg, who's the Director of Programs for Housing Matters, and Monica Lippi, a Senior Analyst with Smart Path to Housing and Health, uh, also part of the Human Services Department. And uh, I forgot to introduce myself. Sometimes I start talking and I forget to do that. I'm Nicole Young. I'm one of the facilitators or consultants for Core Investments, which I'll explain in just a moment. And I'm joined by my co-host. Nicole Lezen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And again, Stella Lauerman is interpreting for us today. And so for anyone who doesn't know, the, the CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it's both a funding model, a way to um, provide funding support to different service providers um, that are supporting our community. And it's also grown into this broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using what we call a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And through multiple rounds of input from different partners and um, community members in both you know, the uh, 
kind of general community and, and nonprofits and public agencies, we arrived at this core mission and vision that you see on your screen. And the thing I just want to point out is, you know, help the words health and equity and resilience, well-being, those are really at the center of core and really drive everything that we do and, and what we focus on in these core coffee chats. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we're talking about ensuring that there are opportunities for all people through all stages of life to experience these eight core conditions for health and well-being. And today we're focusing on stable, affordable housing and shelter. But you can see just in this graphic how connected housing and shelter is to all the other core conditions for health and well-being, health and wellness, lifelong learning and education, economic security and mobility. So what we try to do through these coffee chats, which are just an opportunity for us to all come together and learn and hopefully have that result in collective action, we really try to understand where are the points of intersection among these core conditions and what could we be doing collectively to try to improve that, all with this goal of improving or achieving equity um, for all. And so today we have a chance to hear um, more from some of our local leaders that have been working on providing shelter to people who are experiencing homelessness or are medically vulnerable and some of the challenges, but also some of the lessons learned um, in trying to um, do all this while sheltering in place or while there was a countywide shelter in place order in effect. So again, we're very pleased to have Leslie and Joey and Tom and Monica joining us today. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Leslie to give us an overview of the county's response. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Goodfriend, and um, thank you for inviting us to share um, all of the work that we've been doing since the middle of March when um, our health officer, Dr. Newell, um, placed a shelter in place order in the county of Santa Cruz. In uh, times of emergency or natural disaster, the County Human Services Department's role is to provide shelter. And in the case of our shelter in place order, um, the Human Services Department became responsible for sheltering uh, people who experience homelessness. And uh, in order to do that, um, we had to, or did, um, open a variety of shelters beyond what was already in place um, through in our county. Um, we took over operations of four local hotels. Um, and then we recently took on um, operations of two additional hotels specifically to provide um, space for um, folks who are homeless to shelter, I'm sorry, for isolation and quarantine should they become COVID exposed or COVID positive. Uh, we opened two congregate shelter sites, one at the Vets in Watsonville and one at the Vets Hall in Santa Cruz. Um, so these are open spaces that have tents and cots for um, people who are homeless to stay in. Um, we opened up a shelter up in um, at the Seventh-day Adventist site with some trailers we received from the state for transition age youth who are 18 to 25. Um, we opened up an organized encampment behind the county building on Ocean Street, we call that the Benchlands, providing outdoor uh, space for up, over 100 folks. Um, and we also are, um, have organized outreach. Um, so those who are continuing to camp outside can do so safely, sheltering in place in um, wherever they are, um, wherever they're camping. In order to organize this effort, um, we, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Currently, we are providing shelter to over 500 homeless people. So in order to organize this um, effort, uh, we opened what we call a shelter and care disaster operations center. So I'm gonna, that's called a doc. And we brought together partners. So we have um, our team from human services. We have some people from health services. We also are working with people from Encompass and Housing Matters, the city of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz. So these are all of our partners that are working closely together in order to provide um, these, the shelter for these over 500 homeless people. 
In order to provide the service, we hired over 300 uh, extra help disaster service workers who are providing um, support at all of these different shelter sites. At each of these shelter sites that I named, we have staff who are on site 24-7. Uh, we provide three full meals a day. Um, we provide light medical care. And um, we also have a logistics team that works on ensuring that any kind of sundry items and supplies are provided so people really can stay where they are and shelter in place. Um, in order to refer people that are homeless into our shelter system, we created a centralized referral process. And um, this is a form that can be filled out. It is located on the Human Services Department's website. And I believe um, one of the Nicoles is going to uh, post the link onto the, into the chat. Um, so this referral, uh, once it's completed and filled out and submitted into the um, identified inbox, um, offers a way for people and service providers to refer into our shelter system. And we have a variety of types of folks that um, uh, can be referred into the various um, shelters. Um, just quickly, because our, our other leads might talk more about this, um, into isolation and quarantine, we call those P1 through P3s. So COVID positive, COVID um, waiting for a COVID test result, and COVID exposed. Those are the folks that would go into our isolation and quarantine hotel shelter. And then we have what's called P4. They are medically vulnerable or over 65 years of age who are homeless. And they are who uh, would be placed into one of our hotels. And then what we call P5s, which are folks who are homeless who don't meet the other criteria, they would be referred into one of our congregate shelter systems. We also um, have recently opened what we're calling an alternate housing program. So folks who are in overcrowded housing situations, they're not homeless, um, that need to isolate or quarantine due to possible COVID exposure, they can also be referred into our isolation and quarantine hotel. Um, and uh, we are accepting referrals for our alternate housing program right now specifically from safety net clinics, uh, public health, and our hospitals. Um, we're, we're planning in the next couple of weeks to open up those referrals to that alternate housing program uh, further and more broadly, but um, that'll happen in the next month or so. Um, I also want to um, share that we are working with existing housing programs. Um, we are trying to house as many, permanently as many folks as we can through these existing housing programs. Um, we are these, seeing these people that are in our shelter system um, are new to our system and to the housing um, homeless management information system. So we're trying to provide as much assistance as possible, helping people navigate to permanent housing. And finally, I just would like to say that um, all of this is being funded through state funds um, called Project Room Key, which Monica will talk more about. Uh, we're getting funds from FEMA, and there's also some local dollar match to help support all of this um, tremendous amount of work that has uh, been taking place since the middle of March. And that is the overview of what we've been doing. And um, the rest of the folks are gonna dive in more deeply into what each of these strategies entails. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, that was a great overview. Um, Joey's gonna get us started with some of the details that, that Leslie mentioned, um, talking about what Homeless Persons Health Project has been up to in terms of some outreach related to uh, helping people keep safe during COVID. And Joey's going to tell us about what's been learned from some of the, the outreach that's been going on across the county and also some of the ways that the rest of us can be more helpful and, and some of the needs that they're documenting as they go through the, the outreach and getting people sheltered. So Joey, you're up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nicole. And um, thank you, Leslie, both of you for the wonderful introductions. Um, I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, I'm wearing a mask because I, I share an office 
with uh, with one of our staff. So um, sorry about that. And I'm also at an A's game apparently. So um, you know, have to be safe during COVID. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. So I just want to talk a little bit about the Homeless Persons Health Project first. Uh, we're a part of the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. We're a federally qualified health center. Um, so we provide primary care. We're a patient-centered medical home. We do integrated behavioral health services that include uh, counseling and uh, psychiatry services. We provide substance use disorder services that include medication-assisted treatment and acupuncture. Next slide. We help provide medical services for a 12-bed recuperative care center. So this is a respite center for people experiencing homelessness that are being discharged from the hospital, or maybe they need uh, some respite care prior to going into surgery. Um, and that's located on the Housing Matters campus, and Housing Matters helps us operate that site. Uh, we have a, oh, I'm sorry, one more. We have an on-site medication dispensary. We provide some benefits advocacy and have a money management program. We do manage some permanent supportive housing programs. We provide uh, housing case management and through whole person care, we have some housing navigation. Uh, we do outreach. Basically harm reduction is the foundation of our clinic. So harm reduction services, of course, are really very important, including Narcan distribution to help reverse opioid use. I mean, a, a opioid overdose. And we have a team that works specifically for uh, with frequent users of the ER. Next slide. Uh, I like this slide because this sort of shows the importance of housing for health um, and some of the outcomes that you might see if we are able to house people. So this is one client that was housed and uh, it's a little bit tricky, but you can kind of see the uh, ER visits and inpatient stays prior to being housed. And then post him being housed, uh, over six months of him being housed, he basically had no ER visits. And this was an individual that wasn't very connected to services, was pretty much using uh, the ER as primary care. Uh, but once they started getting engaged with case management, and after being housed, there was a lot more stability and this individual was able to go to their primary care physician. So uh, not only do you have really good health outcomes coming from housing stability, but uh, you also have decrease in cost to emergency services. Next slide. So um, with COVID-19, uh, there's many risks for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, they tend to be more medically vulnerable. Uh, if you're living unsheltered on the street, you are exposed to more acute health problems. Uh, and especially if you're in congregate living situations, uh, that's also the case. So if one person gets the flu, uh, it can go around pretty quickly. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of individuals have advanced age that are living unsheltered on the streets, even in Santa Cruz County. So we know that with COVID-19, that is a risk factor for mortality. Uh, limited ability to follow public health guidance. So, you know, um, hygiene, washing your hands, uh, showering, all those things are definitely more complicated if you're living at an encampment versus even in a shelter. Um, so, and then of course we have stigma and discrimination uh, that have unfortunately always existed working with this population, but um, even even sometimes more so with COVID-19 because uh, people have their own stereotypes about people experiencing homelessness uh, and that they might be vectors actually of COVID-19. The reality of that, interestingly enough, is that we've had um, relatively few cases of uh, COVID-19 among people experiencing homelessness in this county um, compared to other counties. So next slide. So some of the recommendations, and sorry for the acronym for the PEH, that's People Experiencing Homelessness. Uh, these are recommendations put out by the National Health Care for the Homeless. And if you've never visited their website, I strongly encourage you to do so. There's a lot of really good information on there. Uh, but of course, 
establishing establishing isolation and quarantine spaces. So Leslie did a really good job of explaining the role of the Human Services Department in helping set these up. And I think uh, I, I think Monica or Tom might also talk to this. Um, delivering services while in isolation and quarantine. So if you have an isolation shelter, uh, obviously making sure that it's set up so that people can shelter in place, bringing as many services as you can to that space to keep people there so they don't have to uh, go to multiple locations and possibly transmit the virus um, or contract the virus from somebody else. Uh, assisting shelters with screening and preparation. So this is part of a wider effort from the health services agency and, and other agencies to just make sure that uh, different shelters uh, have the supplies that they need to properly screen people for symptoms for COVID-19 and also providing up-to-date guidance uh, to prepare them for what if somebody does come up with symptoms uh, can they isolate them separately? Who do they contact to get public health involved uh, to possibly test other people or do contact tracing? The sort of the necessary steps that um, are are important for mitigating uh, future spread of COVID-19. Uh, providing services to encampments and other unsheltered individuals. So if you have encampments, the best way to people to shelter in place is again to bring services to them. Um, uh, expanding testing protocols. So I know a few weeks ago the CDC put out some information about how we uh, maybe don't need to test asymptomatic individuals. This is definitely not the case nor the recommendation of, um, of our clinic. Uh, it's not the recommendation of the California Department of Public Health and I think since then the CDC has sort of backtracked because uh, we know that quite a few people uh, can transmit this virus and be completely asymptomatic. So it's even more important for more vulnerable populations, especially those that are living in congregate living situations, to have a more expanded, robust testing effort take place in those spaces, whether it's uh, our teams going out to the shelters or encampments and testing people on site, or just offering it in case uh, they want to call our clinic and schedule an appointment. And, and we're able to do uh, curbside as well as drive up testing at our clinic if people uh, call and, and let us know um, for our patients. Uh, coordinating PPE and supplies, of course, PPE is uh, hard to come by, but you know, if we are able to share our resources, uh, it's going to make everybody much more safer. Um, and then, of course, continued access to food programs. So making sure that everyone's getting uh, good, healthy food is really important to uh, support the shelter in place activities. Next slide. So for us, the Homeless Persons Health Project, like many other clinics, we've had to adapt to COVID-19. So this includes uh, having social distancing measures, increasing hand washing and disinfecting protocols, uh, a lot more PPE, um, that's personal protective equipment. Um, we're doing a lot of testing for COVID-19 uh, and we were one of the early ones from the beginning to start doing testing uh, asymptomatic individuals out in the field. Uh, we tend to be the clinic that if there is a call, if there's somebody that might have symptoms, we will go out into the field and test them, whether it's at an encampment or a shelter. Uh, and and so we, we're doing a lot of that work already. Uh, of course, we've adapted by having more telehealth appointments. Uh, so fewer in-clinic, in-person appointments and more telehealth, telephone appointments, uh, unless it's necessary, unless we need to physically see that person. Um, you know, it's, it's probably safer both for the patient and for the staff to do more telehealth. Having said that, we know that there's barriers and limitations working with uh, people experiencing homelessness. So uh, we do quite a bit of walk-in appointments and we do in-person appointments. We have a small clinic, only three exam rooms, but we have a few tents outside. So we see people in both spaces. Uh, taking into consideration the uh, air exchanges and ventilation and cleaning that's necessary to see patients safely in this type of environment uh, uh, and the time that it takes to do that. 
So uh, I already talked about the supporting shelter in place for individuals without shelter. And then again, um, going back to in-person appointments. So we are doing non-COVID-19 clinical care at the clinic. So this is important just for people's general health and not all the county clinics, um, they are doing in-person appointments because you know um, uh, kids need their vaccinations. Uh, individuals with diabetes still need regular checkups. So um, all of that is really important. Next slide. So also some of the things that we started doing early on is we set up a 24 seven COVID-19 nurse on call line. And this was uh, distributed to all the different shelters and encampments uh, specifically to get after hours advice from a nurse from our clinic. Uh, that's specific to COVID-19. So if uh, it's 9 p.m. and somebody is complaining about symptoms related to COVID-19 or they think it might be related, uh, it's just basically a problem solving line in a way that we can get early detection and provide support over the phone and maybe do follow up immediately the next day. Um, and that's, you know, been relatively successful in the beginning. It's not being utilized as much right now. So I'm going to try and pitch it again to all the different shelter providers and let them know that's still there. Uh, we do nurse visits at the different isolation motels and that's a great way to just maintain continuity of care with uh, a patient population that um, a lot of times misses appointments or we might miss them because they're having to move from one place to the next. So having again that stability of being in a physical location, having shelter is so crucial to somebody's health. And um, some preliminary data that I saw last week is that uh, quite a few of the frequent users of the ER um, have had increased visits to all of, all of our clinic sites. And I think I'm suspicious, I gotta review the data, but I think that has something to do with the establishment of these uh, motels. Because uh, now they have a place to live. We know where to find them. We don't have to search for them. They're not moving from one place to the next. It's easier to locate them and provide care to them on site. Um, so we, we also do site visits at the expanded shelter sites. Uh, and we help coordinate the, some of the prioritization of the referrals for those isolation motels. And I think Monica can discuss that more. Next slide. Joey, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I think we're running a little short of time. So could I ask you to just wrap yeah. up so we can hear from Tom and Monica? Thank you. I know it's a lot of great content. Yeah, so we know some of the barriers of accessing care. We can go to the next slide. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so doing a mobile health clinic is extremely important. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you can bring in revenue and see more patients that way. The next slide. To do effective outreach, you have to have really robust teams that are trained to do this type of work. And we rely on the coordination of several different agencies, including Community Action Board, Arm Reduction Coalition, as well as uh, Housing Matters and um, different departments within the county. So this is a photo of somebody that is at one of the encampments. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we have different sites that actually set up tables and they have different supplies and then they also branch out and do more uh, outreach at the different encampments. And so those are set sites, but aside from those, we have outreach workers that are going um, pretty much every day of the week out to different sites and they're distributing several different types of supplies. Uh, it tends to be a gateway for volunteers and it's pretty effective. So this last part about the 28 completed medical visits, this is when we just have a medical provider doing medical visits and we find some good information there that uh, quite a few of them had no connection to a primary care physician. So that's good for us because we can uh, establish care with them and hopefully uh, maintain health care for them. Uh, next slide. And so what we'd like to do and uh, very soon, probably at the end of January, we'll have a 23 foot van that's going to be a mobile health clinic and we'll be able to provide all these different types of services and referrals 
through that dam uh, if it's staffed appropriately. Next slide. And I, I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Joey. That was um, so amazing and so impressive, like all the work that's being done to coordinate and do outreach. And, and um, let's just wish we had more time to, to keep hearing you share some information. Um, but we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to hear from Tom Stagg, the <clears throat> Director of Programs for Housing Matters. And he's going to share with us some of the efforts that have been made around providing congregate shelter during COVID-19 and some of the challenges, again, and adaptations that they've had to make to do that. So, Tom, I will turn it over to you and have you tell me when to advance the slides. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Joey. Um, you reminded me of a lot that we've done along the way, but I wasn't at the forefront of my mind. So, as I was introduced, my name is Tom Stagg. I'm the Director of Programs at Housing Matters. If you're not familiar with us, we are a homeless services provider, and some of the services that we do include three shelters on Coral Street and one transitional housing program. So one's a family shelter, one's for single adults, and we operate the Recuperative Care Center, which is for individuals experiencing homelessness coming out of the hospitals or emergency rooms. And so back in March, when COVID was really taking off and becoming the issue that it is now and shelter in place first started, the County of Santa Cruz came to us at Housing Matters and asked for our participation in the sheltering programs that Leslie mentioned in her overview. So I've been supporting the county since March in standing up and operating the congregate shelters and some other sites that we have in response to COVID. And there's a few people on the call that have helped with that. Um, Monica, who will speak next, and I saw Serge Cagno on the in the audience, so he was also instrumental in standing up these shelters. Um, and it's really in response to shelter in place. That recognition that Joey talked about that people experiencing homelessness need a safe place to shelter in place where they can social distance. And that's not always an option when you're out on the streets or in a camp. So the county has stood up these sites. We have two congregate indoor sites. So the Santa Cruz Vets Hall and the Watsonville Vets Hall, the picture on your screen with the blue tents is actually the inside of Watsonville Vets Hall before we started. And there's also, we did an outdoor camp on Coral Street for a few months, which is the bottom left-hand corner where we had individual tents and bathroom, bathrooms available and staffed for people that had been on Coral Street. There's a quick picture of one of the motels that Monica is gonna talk about. And on the next slide, we'll see a few of the other sites. So um, Santa Cruz Vets Hall is one of the sites, which is the picture on the right where we have dividers for some spaces that have cots. There's also some indoor tents there as well. And then the travel trailers on the left-hand side of your screen are the Seventh-day Adventist site where we got 13 trailers from the state that are being used to house transition age youth, which are individuals um, between the ages of 18 and 24. So there's about 20 youth over at Seventh-day Adventist who are using those trailers. And then at the two vets halls, we have about 40 people at each of those. And then right now the bench lands next to the courthouse, as Leslie mentioned, is a other outdoor site using tents like we did in Coral Street. And that's about 80 people there right now. So in the congregate shelters, we have about 180 people that have gotten shelter since March through these new sites. And as we talk about um, what changed in shelter from pre-COVID to COVID, a lot of it is in that physical space, how, this, how these shelters are designed. And so if you ever had experience with shelter pre-COVID, the really, the focus was on efficiency, getting as many people into shelter as possible. So that meant bunk beds, spacing them close together, using every room that you had, so every space. So even a small room that might look like a closet, as, as shelter operators, we, were, we would think, how can we get someone in there? Because we want as many people under one roof as possible. And that meant also to fill every bed. You don't ever want an empty bed because that means someone is on the streets 
who could be inside. With COVID, that has really changed a lot where we can't do that. The guidelines have recommended social distancing in, in, in a way even when you're sleeping. So six feet between people when they're sleeping. And so we've had sites, some of the existing sites that we had, like the Paul Lee Loft here at Housing Matters, we had bunk beds and we had those bunk beds more than three feet um, or less than three feet apart from each other. Our recuperative care center, we had rooms with roommates, so two people per room, and there was only about three feet between the beds. So we really started to look in the creation of these new sites of making sure that there's enough space in between, but also having barriers. So you saw the tents inside, which is a model that we first used in Santa Cruz at the Armory um, when River Street Camp moved there and then getting dividers when um, there aren't tents or for people that um, have mobility issues and they might not be able to get down onto the floor to use a sleeping pad inside a tent. And some of the cots that we have don't fit in the tents. So we use the dividers to create some personal space. And it's really that physical barrier to prevent um, any transmission through coughing, speaking, breathing between people. Um, we could go to the next slide. Um, each site, um, we've made sure to have bathrooms available. And if there's not showers on site, we have showers visiting. And there's really space to stay during the day. Um, the sh shelters began when we first had the full shelter in place, um, really minimizing any non-essential activity. And so it was designed to be somewhere where someone can stay 24-7. In shelters pre-COVID, a lot of models had the shelter, the dorm spaces or where people slept. Closing in the morning, people had to be out, uh, out in the community during the day and then come back at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. and then they can access their bed. Now, all the shelters, we're using 24-7 access so someone can stay there. They don't need to go somewhere. And building, places, building spaces where people are able to be there. Joe, we talked about the services that we're bringing in, and that includes public health nurses, some staff from HPHP, behavioral health, mental health specialists, case management from organizations like Salvation Army and Downtown Streets team. We have setups at some of the sites for telehealth. So there's actually computers and monitors and cameras, so they can do a Zoom meeting just like us. Um, I know of some clients who have used Zoom at the shelter to attend their AA meetings. So really building out a space that people can stay at. And that's actually was one of the challenges early on and continues to be is just having entertainment options where people feel that they can stay indoors and stay at their site and not have to leave. And so books, puzzles, art supplies, things like that um, are really essential for having people have something to do. I talked about how we used to want to use every space all the time as a bed. Now we have some spots reserved at each shelter for quarantine or isolation. So if someone comes in and we, they have symptoms or they think that they need to get a COVID test, we have spaces that are separate from the congregate settings for people to be able to quarantine until they get tested. Or if they do test positive and they need to isolate, for 10 to 14 days, we can accommodate that in the shelters if we're not able to find an alternate site where they can do that, like one of the motels. So really, um, that's something new is reserving site or reserving space for people who might have COVID symptoms where we can separate them from the rest of the group so that we're minimi minimizing that potential for exposure, but still keeping people into, in the shelter. There's also a lot more cleaning and sanitizing going on than normally. So there's actual protocols for um, how many times a day, very fre frequently, and making sure that we use cleaners that will kill the virus. Um, and then we're also providing three meals per day at these sites. So someone doesn't have to leave to get food, which would be a really important thing for them to do. So really all of this is based on that shelter in place. And of course, we're emphasizing social distancing at all times when people are in the shelter. Now, when we started, masks were voluntary. It was a recommendation, but it wasn't something that, um, at that point in time, it wasn't 
the requirement the state the city hadn't said you have to mask when you're in public but early on we did adopt that so everyone indoors so staff and clients um, unless you're in your sleeping space the rule is that you have to have your mask on when you enter the building next slide oh and the screen screening and temperature check so also upon entry we're doing um, screening for symptoms i remember back to the beginning there we started with three symptoms it was do you have a fever do you have difficulty breathing or do you have a cough and now that list is expanded to i think nine symptoms that we're checking every time someone comes in and then our entry ways at the front desk when someone comes back whether a guest or a staff person there is a um we have a thermometer there that we do temperature temperature checks like other public spaces the grocery store um restaurants we have the the plastic shields in between and um, staff and clients and all of that so a lot of those physical spaces change to accommodate COVID. now we can go to the next slide thanks for popping back um 24 7 operations three meals a day quarantine and isolation space um, for that um, referral process which has been mentioned it we're really looking at COVID vulnerability and then the other thing that we've adopted in these sites is a low barrier model so we're bringing more people into shelter and that includes people that haven't traditionally sought shelter in um, the homeless services and shelter world we talk about three p's that are things that prevent someone from wanting to access shelter which are partners pets and possessions so if you're a shelter that doesn't take partners that's going to keep a lot of people out because they don't want to go in without their partner or same thing with their pet or if they have a lot of possessions and so we've built into these shelters one because we're using the tents and doors or we have the dividers that couples can actually stay together and in Watsonville we have a room designated for families so we're working and we're working to bring in people regardless of their family status or if they're a couple or a single and we do allow pets as long as um, the pet is under the control of the owner and there's no aggressive behavior and they're cleaning up after the pets and we have some room for storage at, I think at each of these sites um, people still can't bring everything they have in, in every case but we are trying to be accommodating and have places and when people because we're 24 7 people can leave their stuff and have access to it during the day and don't have to worry about um, let, I have to pack everything that I need for the day and leave or what's going to happen to my stuff when I'm not at the shelter so that's one thing and then in terms of what we're looking for or what it takes to come in we don't have any exclusionary factors such as sobriety or um, being in mental health treatment or having case management it's really if you need shelter and you're able to meet the expectations of, around respect for other people in the shelter there's no barrier to, barrier to entry and we have some other policies on how we work with that so that's the big overview of what the sh what's how we built the shelters and um, with the policies and procedures and physical adaptations we have to make and moving forward i think some of the big things that we're going to keep from this one is having different options so there's having the outdoor spaces as well as the indoor congregate or the motels and really give someone an option so if they're kind of not sure about coming into shelter they can go to one that meets their interests and their needs i think a big one from the client side that has also we've seen a lot of changes in interpersonal relationship and kind of like how people act towards each other at the shelters is having that private space of the tent or the dividers between beds that where people can really relax and don't feel like they're being watched or they're always with people so that's one where we've even heard that people say um people say that oh i see that you have tents at your at the shelter i'd come into there where they wouldn't previously come to a congregate shelter where they're in that traditional room that has 20 or 30 people in it with bunk beds so they're um so that's been one plus for getting people in and it also helps with um how people treat each other when you don't have to worry about everyone um being in your being in your space and always being on view um, low barrier i think this is the most the most shelter we've had in the county that has a low barrier model and it's really been a kind of a proof of concept to show that it 
we can have safe shelters, even with low barriers to entry. And then the last thing I think is really important that we keep, as that has been um, really beneficial, is that 24-7 operations where it's a true shelter that you don't have to leave during the day and have your, and you still have your space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, we are gathering questions in the chat. We may not get to all of them today because we're running short of time, but we'll collect them and we'll ask everyone to respond. But meanwhile, Monica is going to tell us a little bit about some, some new kinds of relationships and partnerships with uh, hotel and motel owners and others to keep people safe who are medically vulnerable. So Monica, let's, let's go ahead and get, let you get started. Sure. Um, I think as a co-host, I messed something up and, and I don't see the slides anymore. So if one of you guys could maybe take that over, I'm sorry, I said I would do my own, but oh, there okay. it is. Okay. No <laughs> yeah. Well, um, okay. So thank you both of the Nicoles for the invite to speak with this group today. Um, so uh, you can see from my title here on this slide that I'm an analyst for Smart Path, our county's uh, coordinated entry system. But to be clear, I'm not speaking about that today. Um, supporting Smart Path was really my primary role pre-COVID. Um, and my job, as many of ours, has really changed since COVID. And so I'm here to present from my new lens as one of the lead managers of the IQV Hotel Shelter Project. Um, I don't know how to switch slides. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Monica, just give me the verbal cue and you want me yeah. to move to the next slide for you. Sure, thank you. Um, so Project Room Key, for those of you that don't know, was an initiative by Governor Newsom and we call our local Project Room Key the IQV Project, which stands for the Isolation and Quarantine of Vulnerables. Um, just an interesting fact, California was the first state in the nation to secure FEMA funding to provide safe isolation capacity for people experiencing homelessness in order to protect them from the uh, protect them and the broader community from COVID-19. Um, and state and local governments through Project Room Key are able to secure 75% share of cost reimbursement from FEMA, and that reimbursement covers the cost. Um, for Project Room Key, um, the cost of hotel rooms, the program's wraparound services, including daily meals, security, transportation, and other motel-related costs. And like Leslie said, because the county's human services department, or, or we call it HSD for short, um, is responsible for emergency sheltering, this is a function of all social services agencies across the state. Um, and because of this, the HSD supplies the shelter staffing and IQV project oversight um, with the support from the health services agency in the areas of behavioral and physical health services. Um, so when our local shelter in place order was initiated, a small subgroup of the shelter and care doc that, that Leslie had mentioned um, started planning for the IQV project and we opened our first hotel in April. Um, and in just that first month during the shelter in place order, um, during our planning phase, we secured a hotel lease, we set up linen and laundry services, um, developed a bazillion policies and procedures. We agreed on the program's rules. Um, that was kind of a sort of challenge um, because there, there were some people that had really wanted the rules to be very strict. However, we landed on trying to um, provide a really um, low barrier shelter model, kind of like Tom was explaining with the congregates. Um, we ordered all the supplies. We set up a meal delivery service with other HSD partners. We designed a staffing structure and hired and trained staff. We created um, the community referral process and sent that out to the public to start building a list of eligible participants. And then finally opened our first site in April. It was um, a huge undertaking, a lot of 12 hour days to say the least. Um, and we did so good at opening one hotel, which at that point we really didn't think that we were gonna have any more, but 
the volume of referrals that really just never stopped, it still hasn't, um, drove us to open another motel and then another one and then another one so that by July we had opened six. Um, so now I'll go a little bit into the numbers. Uh, four of our hotels, I think Leslie kind of covered this a bit, but four of them are filled with what we call vulnerables. Um, and everyone, we all believe that everyone experiencing homelessness is vulnerable. However, there is a specific criteria a person must meet to qualify for Project Room Key. They either have to be 65 years of age or older, or they must have a medical condition that the CDC considers to make someone more at risk should they con contract the virus. So examples are people with chronic health conditions, diabetes, um, lung issues, or those that are immunocompromised. Um, so two of our hotels are specifically designed to shelter um, people experiencing homelessness that live in overcrowded homes that are in need of isolation and quarantine because they are either COVID positive or are presumed to be positive. These are our short-term um, stay hotels while guests in the other four hotels are permitted to stay for the duration of the program. And in total of the six hotels, we have 241 rooms occupied by 188 people. Um, the only unoccupied rooms we have are in the isolation quarantine, the two hotels, um, and the numbers there change as our COVID cases fluctuate. Uh, and the project has really grown to feel like its own little department with over 80 staff. Um, each motel has its own site manager and assistant manager, 24-hour staffing, um, a management team, which is really just now just me and one other person. And um, we recently created a new team of mental health specialists to work with our guests that are in need of behavioral health support. We also had a public health nurse on the project, but since it has grown so large, our health services agency is stepping in to create a team specifically for physical health oversight. Um, and some of the other partnerships we've developed include with local businesses to help with the building maintenance and cleaning needs. Um, HP, HP like staff, uh, Joey mentioned um, HPHP staff does help with, um, they, they do weekly on-site health checks and um, they also support the review and triaging of our, our referrals. We rely heavily on our homeless service provider organizations, um, such as Tom, <laughs> for their experienced advice on how to serve this population in a, a shelter setting. Um, and we also do regular multidisciplinary team meetings with our adult protective services as we share a lot of, of their clients. Um, so that's just my general overview of the IQV project. Most of the remaining sites are just photos I thought this audience might want to see. So if you want to um, go to the next slide, Nicole. Okay, so this is uh, one of, an example of one of our rooms. Um, this is my favorite hotel, if, if I had a choice to stay in, this would be the one. Um, it's just got the most modern furniture and um, it's very nice and cozy and clean. And, but each of the hotel room, hotels in all the rooms have pretty much a similar setup. They have a, a bed, a TV, a desk, and um, a mini fridge and a microwave. Um, so the next slide. This is an example of one of our, our lobbies. Um, and we, each of the lobbies have um, a, a gent, like a sort of a resource uh, kind of um, board or a board with information that they supply every day um, and information. Some of them have, uh, you'll see on other sites, there's other like ways to communicate resources out to the guests, but we try to make our lobbies as welcoming as possible. Uh, next slide. This is just um, a couple pictures of some happy staff wearing their protective, personal protective equipment, masks and gloves, and uh, they really like that um, clean hands saves lives poster that the county made. Um, next slide. 
And here are a couple other staff. One is making coffee. Our guests really like coffee. Um, and uh, the uh, other was uh, one of our assistant managers preparing um, a meal delivery. And the next slide. Oh, and this is uh, another assistant manager. He's, he's um, taking out the soiled linens. We fill, fill one of those bins up very frequently. And then the, on the other side, the other photo is of a, a smoking area. It's most of the rooms are don't allow smoking. Um, and she's one of the staff is hanging up um, uh, a bee trap because we don't want our guests to be stung by bees while they're out there smoking. <laughs> Next slide. Um, more happy staff and that photo on the right um, just shows we've got an endless supply of snacks. Um, you can't really tell, but in the window there, that's their sort of resource board um, that they put information out to guests on the other side of that window, it's our main corridor through that hotel for people to come and go. We really try to make sure that they're really informed about different resources in the community. Um, next slide. And oh, there's Louis. He's one of our drivers. Uh, we have two drivers on the project, Eugene and Louis, and they really, um, they are really crucial to our project. They take our guests everywhere um, to their doctor's appointments, to pick up their prescriptions, um, and um, they, they run supplies to the different sites. Um, and then the other photo is just an example of our security guards, which we rely heavily on, on controlling access, making sure people that aren't part of the project don't come on site. Um, and the next slide I think is the last. Yeah, the left is uh, just a picture. We have uh, each of the sites has games and art supplies. And we're also um, putting and selling computer stations. Um, shared computer stations at each of the sites because since the libraries have been shut down, a lot of our guests really heavily relied on, on the libraries to access the internet and um, it's been a, a huge void um, for a while. We'd like to help them regain. And then on the right is um, some artwork that our guests had uh, made for us in appreciation for, for the project and we proudly display it. Um, and I think that's it for my photos. Um, so then Nicole's asked us to share a little bit on, on some of the challenges. Uh, we've had quite a few, but for the most part, some of our biggest is standing up 24 hour operations was challenging for the county. It's not something we typically do. And this project does really demand often, you know, in the middle of the night or weekend responses that we just weren't really doing pre-COVID, so that was a has been a challenge. Um, and also providing sheltering is a huge challenge because the department never did, did that before. We don't have much shelter experience, although we work with the, this population, we just hadn't had any sheltering experience. So we really rely heavily on our, our partners to help us um, teach us kind of best practices in that area. Um, and then something else that has been with us this whole time is that we, we've been grappling with is, is, our, is the loneliness that our, a lot of our guests have. A lot of them share rooms with their partners or families, but we also have a lot of guests that are single occupants. And um, we have set up uh, a connection with a, with a nonprofit called Miracle Messaging that's a volunteer-led organization that um, partners up with um, guests and makes weekly calls and check-ins, but not all of our, our guests really utilize this service. Um, and so what we've, we've been trying to do for a while is, is kind of set up weekly social, dis socially distanced gatherings um, uh, at the hotel outside, um, but it just hasn't really taken off. Um, we, we would like to be able to you know, maybe set up 12-step program meetings or crafting circles. Um, and so I'm kind of just throwing this out there to this audience. If anyone has any experience or connections with doing group type work, support group uh, work, um, please feel free to please, please connect with me so we can maybe uh, 
try to set something up and utilize uh, your expertise in that area. Um, and I think that was it for my slides. Thank you, Monica. And thank you, Joey and Leslie and Tom for all of you uh, being here today, sharing such uh, important and um, interesting information. Some of it I hadn't heard before. And so I think all of us in the chat, several people are expressing appreciation also just for the amount of work and coordination and, um, and just um, a lot of appreciation and, and um, amazement over what can happen. Like when people put their minds to it and coordinate in different ways and get creative. So um, it looks like our guests have, have been answering questions in the chat as we've been going along. And so uh, we appreciate that. We are at the end of our time today. And so we know that sometimes people have to get off right at um, our closing time. We will stay on for a few minutes more for anyone that does have a burning question that they wanna ask. Um, and just keep an eye out for upcoming core coffee chats and events. Um, and we ask that you fill out the satisfaction survey today or the feedback survey today. The links are posted in the chat. And again, just thank you everyone for joining us today and to our presenters for taking the time to, to share all your valuable information. Thanks everyone. And thanks again to, to Stella Larman for doing the translation of this that allows us to have both English and Spanish versions and, and recordings that will be available afterwards. And is Susan Brucci still on the line? Susan, do you wanna um, ask your question out loud? Thanks, it looks like Leslie already. Okay. Sorry, I've been having uh, video problems. No, I was interested in that it seemed like there might be a way that um, other partners could or the um, safe distancing uh, types of activities and um, get-togethers. And Leslie, do you want to expand on your answer? Thank you. Yeah. So for our hotel sites, um, there. I mean, right now the weather is fine, and so um, we have outdoor locations where people can go outside to meet and do um, practice social distancing. Um, and in the congregate shelter sites, there, there are some rooms, I'm not just so sure about Watsonville, but I know it, um, in that Santa Cruz, there are some very big rooms that are um, available for group meetings where people can be socially distanced apart. Um, you know, as, as the weather uh, shifts and it gets colder and rainy, um, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated um, to do kind of group gatherings. Um, and the other, the other thing at the, at the hotels, a lot of the hotel rooms have phones. And so we're able to communicate with people via phone um, or they have their own cell phone. Um, so I, I do think though, as the weather shifts, it's, it is going to get a little bit more challenging to figure out how to do that at these hotel sites so that it can happen safely. We had done some work previously um, at the Homeless Services Center when it was that, uh, and about uh, the College of Botanical and Healing Arts about self-care, and um, particularly uh, herbs and plants and essential oils. No, no laughing over there, Nicole. <laughs> but anyway, it was really helpful, and we had the the college send out some folks. So. If, if that might be of interest, that's something that we could potentially do and do on a mobile basis. And it kind of gives folks um, agency about their own health care as well. And it's, it's kind of nice. So could throw that out there as a po possibility. I think that would be great. I think, yeah, I think that would be. So, yeah, if you want to connect either with Tom or Monica or I, Susan. Thank you. And, and this is Joey, just to second that, um, our acupuncturist and I, we've talked about that a little bit. And so um, there might be some interest in maybe having our acupuncturist come out to the shelters if we can arrange a, a socially distant um, group, ac group acupuncture clinic. So I think we could make it work. 
Yeah, we've been able to do that. You know, we do the Project Homeless Connect. So we've been able to bring the services all together. And, you know, so that's something we could mimic. And I was excited about James Van, too. So never can tell what we might be able to pull together until we get the real van. That sounds like a really cool addition to the shelter work we've been doing. The herbs and the acupuncture. That would be great. I think we should get on it before it starts raining. Okay, sounds good. Does anyone else who's remaining on the call have a burning question for our presenters before we end the meeting? Okay, I think we are officially done. Thank you, everyone. 